don't be a micromanager. Three tactics to coach and guide without being a micromanager or a-hole. This will result in less sick days on your team or in your company, higher employee pulse check survey results, and less work and frustration for you. Do you know this is even possible amidst the chaos that we're finding ourselves in the uncertainty or in VUCA environments, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous? I would submit that the three things I'm going to be talking about are exactly what are needed amidst chaos in those VUCA environments. And we're going to talk about why it's important to you, the leader, why it's important for the team, and why it's important just in general for us to not micromanage others. Because let's face it, we don't like to be micromanaged, and then we turn around and turn micromanage others. We use terms like detail-oriented or hands-on or involved, those sorts of things. If you use those terms, well, maybe, uh, maybe you might be somebody that is a little bit of a micromanager. And it's important to recognize that as leaders, we're here to support the team and we won't, don't want to put undue stress on them and we want to lead them and support them and we want a group that wants to work for us. So last week I was out of town and I was doing a week-long course in city of Montreal in Canada. And it was a pilot course, a, a, a new course. There were 24 individuals from across the country that were there from all sorts of different levels of government, different responding agencies. This particular course was a crisis leadership course. And we were brought together to talk about how to work as a team using a formalized process. And in this particular context, how to respond to a uh, tornado and flood, for example. And those are just some scenarios that we use to build the team. And I found myself with an entirely new group of individuals, both facilitators, fellow facilitators. I'd worked with one previously, but the others, uh, the other three, I guess it would be, I knew a little bit, um, but had never worked directly with. And certainly the, the range of agencies I hadn't worked with and the participants, I knew a couple of them just because of my own jurisdiction, but for the most part, didn't know anybody. And we were taking those 24 members and we were putting them into three teams. So I had a team of eight. So one of the questions I often ask is, how do I go about approaching this? How do I go about taking a bunch of folks who don't know me, don't know each other, I don't know them, and bring them together to become a high-performing team as quickly as possible without micromanaging, without being an a-hole? without impeding their progress and without being a barrier to their learning, all of those other things. As a leader, I've recognized and have taken steps to account for micromanaging. I remember we were deployed for a wildfire crisis in Northern Alberta, and I was the quote unquote, the department head of a rather large department responding to this particular event. And there was a lot going on. There were evacuations. We were dealing with evacuees. We were dealing with re-entry back into the municipality. We were dealing with the event, the fire itself. We were dealing with all sorts of things going on. Huge profile. And it was literally a worldwide story. So I would find myself at times going into the various rooms, but one in particular that I was looking after that was... Uh, being looked after by what we call in the crisis leadership world, a deputy or a VP, essentially, and be a, a corporate equivalent. And I found myself a few times marching on in there and really, you know, messing shit up. Basically, I would barge in because, you know, I'm the head of the department and I've got something to say or I've got something I need to do and so on and so forth. And it understandably was disruptive. It's like a bull in a china shop. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this. You know, if you have a micromanaging boss, which chances are you do or have, and that's why you're, you're paying attention to this episode. But I recognize that it was disruptive and really nobody needs that kind of hassle. So through some self-awareness and self-reflection and conversation, I needed to fix that. And I needed to fix it for myself, selfishly, which I'll get into, or um, or more importantly, for, for the team. So I'll just keep that there and I'll talk about the strategy and the techniques that we arrived upon to get to the point where I was no longer micromanaging. And what I've recognized is I've had the desire and need to be self-aware 
through all of these years, because I also recognize that now that I've been doing it for so long, a lot of the approach becomes intuitive. And, uh, and it's not because I have a gift by any stretch, but I've been self-aware. I've reflected on what is the progress or what are the steps to progress through, you know, team, uh, creation, all of those other things. And I recognize that as a leader, particularly if I'm facilitating, I'm a coach or a guide, there are some very specific principles and approaches that I employ and did deploy even as recently as last week. And so those are the ones that I want to share. I also recognize in myself that there's a split second or maybe a couple seconds of, of kind of trepidation that, that hits. And, and it's, it's, I think it's completely natural when you're going into a new group and you're working with an ad hoc team or a team that you haven't hired is that, okay, how am I going to do this? Am I able to do it? I've been pretty successful up until now, but maybe this week is the week where I'm not able to do it. Again, I recognize that there was that momentary trepidation, even with all the years of experience that I have. And, and I also gave myself the grace to realize, hey, you know what? That's kind of normal because I care deeply about what I do. I care deeply about helping others and I want to do a good job, not do a good job for me, but that's not what I'm about. And that's not what, uh, what my purpose was for the week. I wanted to make sure that they had an enjoyable experience. They learned a lot. They grew as a team. And when they went back to their own agencies, they had a whole bunch of really great skills that they could use in their crisis environments. So as I worked through the week, I really was deliberate with regard to the approach. Now I didn't think about the approach first and then, you know, deployed it. I actually just was authentic and just went with the flow. And I talk a lot about state of flow and I view flow, not just in your own personal productivity, but a team can get into a state of flow. And so I would act and then I would reflect and say, okay, so why did I do that? And I just recognized that through you know, my AAA method of, of assessing and acting and adjusting. So you would assess the situation, you would act, always, always, always act and then adjust as you went along. So that is really kind of the framework that I use uh, all the time when I'm working with teams and, and making sure that I'm coaching and guiding and not micromanaging. So why are these principles important to you? <laughs> Just so we're clear, I'm actually looking at this from a, a really self-centered lens. So selfish reasons alert ahead, okay? And ultimately I'm acting in my own self-interest, I suppose, you know, I don't wanna spend a week with new individuals hating my life. I don't want to be frustrated and stressed and all of those other things. I want it to be as frictionless as possible for me, for my own well-being, frankly. So, you know, you got to always take that uh, into consideration. So the reasons I'm about to talk to you in terms of why these principles uh, that will follow are important to you is really based on you. So one of the things that you are going to be doing when you deploy these principles and why this is important is you're trying to figure out the strengths and weaknesses of the members on your team so you can support them the best. This means you can assign work based on their strengths, not their weaknesses, which in turn means less micromanagement or detail orientedness. I don't know if that's a word, but basically you don't have to be nearly as involved because you're, you're assigning tasks and projects and, and all of those things based on the strengths of the individuals. So that's one of the reasons that the principles that we're going to be talking about to coach and guide versus micromanaging are important. The second reason is you're ultimately trying to provide psychological safety and comfort to folks. So they're really less stressed. And if they're less stressed, this leads into them making better decisions. So you will have less to correct. You have a team that's committed rather than compliant. And there is absolutely, absolutely more respect influence on the team. And as we've discussed ad nauseum in terms of sources of influence, respect influence is by far and away the most powerful influence. So if you can increase the respect influence on the team, that does translate directly into voluntary commitment rather than fighting for compliance. And it's called the power paradox. So I get more power or influence by giving it away. So that's the second reason. The third reason is that by being at a higher level, you can troubleshoot and spend time where it's needed. So an example of that would be even last week. There was one facilitator that was bouncing around to make sure everything was kind of being coordinated in terms of timings and so on and so forth. And he said something that was really interesting to me. Uh, he said, you know, on, on day two of the program and the simulation scenario, he said, I just knew that you'd be spending time with this particular 
pair of folks that were struggling a little bit. He said, I observed that because I know that you're always surveying the room, but it allows you to spend time with individuals that need the most coaching. And then once you get them up to speed, you're going to back off and then you'll continue bouncing around. And that was 100% accurate. So sure enough, by, you know, getting into a position where you're coaching and you're guiding rather than micromanaging, it will free you up to troubleshoot where you need to. You can deep dive into wherever, um, wherever is needed. And here's the other kind of self-centered approach. You can now do things that are way more interesting. Like you can actually troubleshoot. You can actually problem solve. You can think outside the box. You can look for patterns. You can actually work within your own zone of genius. So if you're backing off using the principles that we're going to talk about, it really, uh, really leads to more interesting days for you. So I talked about three reasons why the principles are important to you. Well, part of leadership, no matter what level you're at, director, uh, VP, CEO, entrepreneur, frontline manager, anything like that, your number one job is actually to support the team. So what are the, the reasons why these, these principles we'll be talking about are important for the team? One is kind of alluded to it or talked about it already is less stress. It's better for the team. It's better for their um, mental well-being. It's better for their physical health. They'll have less sick days. They'll be more fulfilled at work. The second reason is the team will be way more challenged yet still feel supported, which raises morale. They will be leaning into the work rather than disengaging. And the third reason is more fulfillment in general. And it means really less interpersonal conflict. When people are bored, when they're unfulfilled, uh, when they're cranky, they feel undervalued, all of the things. Um, all of which are a result of micromanagement in a lot of cases, then they are coming to work pretty frustrated. And that can lead to more interpersonal conflict, a lack of trust. And, and you're going to see a lot more kind of, um, you know, almost juvenile behaviors start to rear their ugly heads. But really the three reasons, like I said, is there's less stress on the team. So that's better for their physical well-being. The team is going to be more challenged, uh, yet still feel supported. And ultimately they'll be more fulfilled. So those are the three reasons why these principles are important and why you don't want to be a micromanager, but you want to be a coach or a guide for your team. So before we get into even more details, there's a couple of things with regard to general approach. One is, I can't say this strongly enough, give folks the benefit of the effing doubt. No one wakes up and says in the morning, oh man, my job today is going to be to go and mess stuff up. Okay. 99% of the folks, at least no one starts that way. They will eventually maybe potentially be beaten down into thinking that, but ultimately give people the benefit of the doubt. For the most part, people want to do a good job. People want to be a professional. People want to contribute. They want to be valued they want to be people of value. So first and foremost, just recognize that. Okay. So give them the benefit of the doubt. And the second thing, if it's a new team, which a lot of times it is, you do have to be very direct uh, in a project or interactions. You are, as a leader, setting the tone and those expectations. And in fact, being very direct actually is less stressful. It, it takes the stress away from new team members because a lot of them are trying to figure out what they're doing, who's who in the zoo and all those other things. So those two general approaches are important. But let's talk about more specifics, the, the actual meat of this particular episode. The first principle to not be a micromanager and to guide and coach is to seek to understand rather than critique. So what is your rationale or thought process? Be very careful with the tone though. Be very careful with the tone because inflection is everything. Body language is everything. If you are being authentic and you are literally seeking to understand that will come through. Folks will be naturally defensive. So how you respond to different situations will be absolutely critical. And remember, you set the tone. And by really seeking to understand, maybe, just maybe, they have good reasoning, though the outcome may be subject. So they, they had uh, good intentions. They had a good approach to the, a particular situation, but maybe the outcome just didn't work out because they don't have the experience. But be sure that you're rewarding the thinking, even if the result is not optimal. But remember, tone is everything. Another kind of benefit to viewing with curiosity and 
really trying to figure out what their thought process is, it will tell you a lot about their beliefs and their general approach and, and their headspace to solving problems. And just remember that developing leaders is important. It's important to figure out where they default to and what their skill set is and their emotional intelligence and all of those other things. So yet another benefit of asking what their rationale was and viewing things with curiosity. The second principle to being a coach and a guide rather than micromanagement, because remember, no one likes to be micromanaged. And honestly, I don't think people like micromanaging either. It's way too much stress. And that is use the word consider. So it's the power of the word consider. So have you considered such and such? It's a very safe and non-threatening and innocuous way to guide a particular conversation. And it's not directing them, telling them what they need to do, but it will cause them to pause. So have you considered? And they should hopefully stop, pause, reflect, and then maybe they'll have an answer. And so again, it, it's a sense, it, it gives you an opportunity to coach and guide. You may and likely already know the answer, but if you're just telling them what to do and what to think, then they aren't learning to think on their own, much like raising a child. All right. So the second one is the power of the word consider. Have you considered? The third technique or third principle to not micromanage is when you're asked a question, whether it be a, have you considered and then they ask a question back or maybe you're in your office and they come in and they ask, uh, ask for some guidance or something like that. And it's the Aristotle method. And it's really answering a question with another question. When I facilitate, when I work with teams, I rarely uh, will be very direct in my answer. Now that's not, I'm not like shirking work or, or avoiding questions or anything like that. But I think it's really important that we equip individuals to make decisions and be more autonomous. And that autonomy leads to more respect and, and greater uh, work outputs, all of those other things. So deploying what's called the Aristotle method, which is answering question with another question. And in my experience with some guidance, right, they know the answer. And maybe that question is, have you considered? Or, well, what are the thoughts around doing it this way? Or something like that. And really, here's a pro tip for you. It's called the one, three option method. So if they come to you with a question or a problem or an issue, then for them to do that, you now ask them for three options on how to handle this particular situation. So they come to you with one question or one problem or one issue, and you in turn ask them to come up with three potential options. So going back to that whole, you know, how are they thinking? What are they doing? What's their headspace? What's their default? It really is insightful for you. And it also teaches them um, to think about different options and come to you with some potential solutions. I also recognize that sometimes that's not practical. If you have somebody that's brand new on your team or they, they just simply don't have the, the, the experience or the training, then maybe the one to three probably may not work because they simply don't have the background to offer up three options. So that's where maybe the Aristotle method would be good with just answering a question with another question. And that's very similar to have you considered. So those are the three. So just to recap, first one is seek to understand rather than critique. Figure out where their headspace is, okay? So seek to understand rather than critique. The second principle is the power of the word consider. Have you considered? Third principle is deploying the Aristotle method, which is answering a question with another question and just really guiding the conversation to the outcome that you may know is the best, for example. And if you have an experienced team member deploy that one to three option method, which is if they come to you with a question or a problem or an issue, then work through what are three potential options. Remember I talked about that example where I realized my own behaviors were impacting my team? Well, they always do, but my sense of micromanagement or wanting to be heavily involved. So when I look back at it, I ask myself, okay, so why was that? Well, one was as busy as everybody was, Sometimes I didn't have a lot of tactical things to do. One of the things I do do as a leader is attend meetings. I'm a professional meeting -er. And so a lot of times though, when the team is really high functioning, high performing, which I pride myself on being able to create 
and nurture. And I'll talk about that in a, in a further episode. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes you don't have a ton to do. Now, that's not to indicate I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs or my feet are up, but there's a lot of things that you need to, to get involved with in terms of planning and, and process mapping, all sorts of different things. I'm just maybe not banging away on emails and, and things like that. Also, the sense of not stress, but pressure of a situation where you're briefing senior politicians, the work that you're doing, it has a high impact and it has a high profile. And there's a lot of different lenses and a lot of different lasers looking in on what's happening. So, you know, that tends to drive the need for more information and quicker information, all those other things. So I would walk into the planning room and I would, you know, just demand answers. But that's not my character. Those aren't the values I live by. And so myself and Kath, the deputy or the VP or director, however you want to view it in terms of corporate, we, we have an amazing relationship, very open, very transparent, and it's always about the mission, right? It's a mission-driven team that we belong to when we deploy for crisis. And so her and I sat down, and we chatted about it really, really quickly. And I have a huge amount of respect for her. She presumably respects me, although that's probably up for debate, but whatever. Um, and I just said, so what would work? You know, what, what would work for you? I, I realized that what I'm doing now isn't. So what does that look like? So we just kind of went back and forth on it. And really we arrived on a pretty simple solution. Honestly, this is not rocket science. All it was, was if I walked into the, into the room and if she was busy or she didn't want to be interrupted or the room was in a good state of flow or something like that, she would just put her hand up and say, Hey, Daryl, I got this. I got this really innocent. Very uh, unobtrusive, simple to do all of the things. And I just recognized that when I saw that, she had it handled. She had it handled. And so I recognized very early when we started doing it, how many times I would have that natural tendency to want to get involved with something. And it was through her help that I was able to really curb that. Now, just so we're clear, you know, in that particular example, I'm the leader, I'm still ultimately responsible. And I do have the ability and the authority and all the things to get involved and ask questions. And we recognize that. So there was once or twice, hey, Daryl, I got it. Yep, totally understand that. But I do need to know because I'm briefing somebody else or whatever the case is. But I recognize that the impact that I was having on the team was detrimental and it impeded our progress towards the mission. And so Micromanagement is something I'm highly, highly sensitive to. One may submit I'm overly sensitive to, I suppose, in the workplace and on projects and, and during operations and deployments. But I think that it's really important because micromanagement's everywhere. And if you can be equipped with how to handle it, then maybe you're going to be more fulfilled. Maybe you're going to be happier in the workplace. And here's the other thing too. Recognize that when you're a leader, it is having a very, very bad impact on your team. And so maybe to have the conversation with them around, hey, you know what? If I, uh, if I have a tendency to micromanage or get really involved, hey, what does it look like for me to back off and give you some space? Maybe it's, hey, I got this. It could be that simple. So if you start to use one or all of those principles, you'll actually see your employee morale or your team morale go way up. You'll see your workload go down, honestly, or you can start to focus on things that are important to you, things that are interesting to you. And ultimately, we are trying to, we're on a bit of a crusade to abolish micromanagement in the workplace because it is absolutely an epidemic. I totally get it. It's bad for our mental health. It's bad for our emotional health. It's uh, bad for morale. It lowers respect, all of the things. So if we can move you towards becoming more of a coach and a guide rather than a micromanager, then I think we're all going to be better off. And I also understand and I recognize that the folks that really need this episode may not be watching it or may not be listening to it on the Lead from the Inside Out podcast. I'd encourage you to comment and, and like and leave a review. So if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment. I'm curious to hear what your experience is and please like the video. And if you're listening on a podcast, leave a review. I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks for your time.